Minaka and welcome to Talk Business and a big hello as well to our viewers across the region receiving us through Sky Pacific. On the show tonight we travel to the heart of Asia to the Philippines. Talk Business covers the recent international conference organized by the Global Development Network that looks into areas of social protection, inequality and of course the new concept of inclusive growth. Join us over the next half hour as we take a closer look at these pressing issues and the research carried out by socio-economic analysts from around the world and of course our very own from the South Pacific. That's all coming up in the next half hour. Inequality is rising worldwide. The gap between the rich and the poor is the highest in 30 years. Average incomes of the richest 10% of the population are nine times than that of the poorer 10%. Despite considerable progress, poverty is widespread. While some Millennium Development Goals aimed to improve the quality of life may have reached certain targets before 2015, inequalities still persist. There is need for more research and evidence into these areas, a need for improved policies. And to stimulate debate on the matter, academics, researchers, head of governments, representatives of national and international organizations were brought together by the Global Development Network to take on an in-depth look at the issues at hand. The venue, one of Southeast Asia's tiger economies and powerhouse, Manila, Philippines. Right at the heart of the discussions were issues surrounding social protection, inequality and inclusive growth, all intertwined with how governments pursue economic growth. Opening the floor to dialogue was the Filipino president, who acknowledged the important role of governments in the entire equation. It is incumbent upon government to provide meaningful opportunities to individuals and an environment conducive to empowering our fellow citizens to seek out and maximize opportunities that come their way. We get a time of society where a few flourish and the rest must make do with crumbs. We must have use of For us in the Pacific, these development issues present unique challenges, especially in the aftermath of the global financial crisis and when the focus has turned to 2015 post the MDGs. Researchers will have to begin addressing some of those issues now because the donors um, in post-2015 would be interested in the agenda that would be set by the United Nations and I think it's time that the Pacific Island uh, research community uh, begins to think about those post-2015 issues and what they might be for the Pacific and engage uh, and concentrate uh, on, on those areas for research because what the donors would be looking at, I guess, is uh, the kind of research that is there, the kind of issues that will align to what might be considered the development agenda in post 2015. That's why the spotlight has been thrown on social protection. There is little doubt that social protection can become an effective measure to protect people from becoming trapped in poverty. Social protection can empower people to seize opportunities, help workers to adjust to changes and deal with unemployment and in turn support productivity. The reason that governments need to be involved is that that's got to be a credible promise. The thing that a good social security system does for you is it allows people to take a few risks because you know, the downside is not starvation, it's nasty, but it's not you know, a complete catastrophe. So it's got to be credible. If you are funding it with donors or with NGOs, that credibility isn't there you know, because they might just push off 
think it might turn tough, and they'll go. And then you're really stuck. So what, uh, I mean, a good social security system you know, has to be designed to move money, uh, or possibly other things, but usually money to people when they need it. But they've got to know it's there next year, the year after, the year after. You've got to build a structure. It's got to be secure. It's got to be funded securely within the economy as well. So the people say, yeah, I believe in five years. I could take the risk. It all went wrong. You know, in five years, I still have something. Which is why researchers argue that social policies and social protection systems can reduce inequality and go a long way in promoting inclusive growth. But of course, if it were that simple, the world wouldn't have such fundamental development issues. Here in the Pacific, social protection has often been pushed to the back burner. And we have, to an extent, our traditional structures to blame. Government places a high reliance on the informal social protection. When we talk about informal social protection, this is basically how traditional societies that are prominent in Pacific Island countries, how we rely on our extended family networks, how we rely on our community networks within the villages that we live in, in the provinces, in the districts. So government doesn't, hasn't really taken that priority that they need to develop formal social protection systems. We know that Pacific governments have constraints on their budget, they have a lot of areas to prioritize. However, social protection needs to be prioritized. So it has to be in the government's plan. So it has to be actually. So uh, what for, for this we think actually research definitely plays a key part to actually let the policymakers know and actually realize the importance of social protection and how it actually channels down back to the poor. If Pacific governments are truly keen on weaving social protection into development policies, then it can't be considered an afterthought. Nor is robbing Peter to pay Paul going to work. Post 2008 and 2009 global economic crisis, you know, Pacific Island countries did undertake some very innovative, uh, good social protection policies. But some of it was funded by taxing and taking away uh, benefits um, from, from other sectors, plus uh, go, uh, some governments have raised duties on, on imports of, of uh, food, of other essential services that are important for the poor. So you know you can say that uh, you are looking after the um, uh, pe people with disabilities, uh, people over 70, uh, you give them some uh, uh, income support, but if the inflation rate in the country, if your real incomes go down by about 30%, you know, in the case of Fiji, then basically what you're doing is you're taking away, uh, you know, uh, expenditure from from other sectors and giving it uh, and to to the poor, but they're not enough. But here's the tricky part. How can government strike the balance between effective social protection policies and simple handouts? It's a, it's a, it's a construction over time uh, to discover how to combine um, these policies with a set of incentives that is going to be uh, productive uh, for, for growth and make these policies sustainable, sustainable over time. Um, as you know, this question is raised everywhere, so we don't have the answer. I think. The only, I mean, the only advice that, uh, that, that I would uh, like to give is to have a, a constant monitoring of this evaluation of these social protection policies, not only in terms of what they achieve in terms of redistribution of income, but also in terms of the kind of incentives that they create for the whole of the economy. That's why the transition from welfare to workfare is so critical. For certain groups, it's a transitional period. Uh, where you know you you support groups, you provide training, you build their capacity, and on the other hand, you know you put in policies which will support growth, so that it works both ways. You know you are empowering people, you are building capacity of those who are unemployed either through education, training, and at the same time, you know you are adopting you know good policies, investment policies, saving policies, macroeconomic policies generally to support growth. And when you do that, then there is a link.
then you are taking these people out. And while effective policies may be in place, there's no way of really telling just how successful it may be without independent monitoring. So what the government can do is, is, is uh, see whether these objectives are being met or not. And it, it can also uh, you know, assign these to an independent organization or, or a group uh, who can you know, do this for the government as well, for example, if, if, if the government uh, is, is unable to do that, it can always outsource expertise and get others you know, to, to monitor the, the impact of social protection policy. The discourse of development has the power to affect and change people, but inequality hampers any progress. In the case for developing regions like the Pacific, it can become a brutal affair. Faced with financial constraints, compounded by issues of poverty, environmental impacts of climate change and increased health risks, it's a tough job for policymakers which is why it becomes all the more important to have sound social protection policies in place to ensure inequalities that may have resulted through a more liberalized world can be minimized. Especially so for women, who can be impacted differently by policies largely based on their socioeconomic statuses. Never we have policies in place, so it's just is, one size fits all, but that is not the case. We have to take into account that women need special measures in place to help them empower them, to make them feel empowered and make them feel that yes, they can do as much as men do, they are a very important um, part of the economy. So the answer would be a tailor-made solution for each Pacific Island country that dwells deeper into the implications of a policy on women and other minority groups. I can uh, confidently say that some or a lot of the policies that we have do not have uh, a basis or evidence-based policies where uh, you know you have evidence to, to to base your policies on. So I think that's that's where ODN comes in or GDN comes in to try and encourage those kinds of. Uh, you know, research that then gets people together to discuss the findings and then in the process or the ultimate uh, aim would be to, to actually have informed decisions uh, uh, at the end of the, uh, the process. Resource-rich Papua New Guinea is another classic example of the disparities that exist between the rich and poor. It's a land of extremes, where inequalities are synonymous to increased levels of violence and crime, unemployment and poverty. But how can a country that enjoys slightly higher economic growth than others in the region be so rich in minerals and precious metals, yet its people barely manage to get by every day? Could inclusive growth be the answer? About 97% of land in Papua New Guinea is still owned by customary landowners. Um, what inclusive growth would then mean is um, ensuring that more of that land is made available for um, Papua New Guineans as well as investors or overseas investors to have access to and at the same time being able to ensure that that land is um, ownership is still retained by the landowners but they also have that uh, opportunity to uh, lease the land for development. So it's, it's, it's of mutual benefit. Inclusive growth is the current buzzword. What it means is growth at all levels of society, pro-poor and business, and it must be multifaceted. Longea believes it may be some time yet before PNG jumps on the bandwagon as a lot of focus is still purely on economic growth. Given the development experience that the Pacific has had, uh, particularly Papua New Guinea, it will take a while for uh, the Pacific and especially Papua New Guinea to 
take that on board. I mean, the, the, the issue has always been there, but the focus has been on economic growth, not so much on how that growth is distributed in the community. But it will definitely take a while. Why so? It's power politics at play that hinders any notion of inclusive growth. Why is it that we still have uh, uh, income in the hand of a few? And, but I think this is power. This is power politics. You know, it, it's not going to be solved by technical measures. So in the end, it, 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 it requires, changing that requires a change in power politics locally. How to get to that, I don't know. But I think that again, exposing the issues, exposing the challenges, exposing the statistics, the figures that show that some things are intolerable, not only from an economic point of view, but also from an ethical point of view. This kind of thing is likely to help change gradually the uh, politics of inclusive uh, growth. Inclusive growth involves people into the growth process of a country. What it simply enables is the equitable allocation of resources where every facet of society can benefit. But the onus lies on governments. The government cannot continue to provide uh, these income support and social protection for the poor and vulnerable if it doesn't have the means to do so. And it is the responsibility of any government to create the means to grow the economy. It is their responsibility. And, and the responsibility of the... And, and people don't mind paying taxes uh, to, to, to the government if they know that the government are using these revenues in an effective, in an efficient, and in a fair manner. But when you have governments which do not use the revenue that they collect in an appropriate, uh, efficient and uh, in, in a fair way, then it doesn't matter, you know, you could have growth, but you could still uh, linger on with, with increasing levels of poverty and lack of attention to the vulnerable uh, and poor in society. By no means though, is it an easy task? Fiji and other Pacific Island countries need investment, really quality investment to generate uh, uh, employment and, and sustain growth in employment numbers. You also need to look at issues related to property rights. We also need to look at issues related to barriers to trade. We still have uh, uh, high barriers to trade, you know, both uh, tariffs and non-tariff uh, barriers to trade. The desired impact of inclusive growth can only be realized through sound social and economic policies that include social protection mechanisms. We desperately need uh, leaders, researchers and policy makers who can collaborate on, on uh, very important issues that affect uh, citizens in all our countries of course specifically. Uh, and I'm really happy that Global Development Network through Oceania Development Network uh, is encouraging that kind of uh, discussions and uh, I can see from the group uh, that, that participates in the current uh, conference, I think the, the younger people who are now part of those discussions. I think part of the responsibility of uh, uh, people like us, you know, who, who are academics, you know, who do research and those uh, young researchers who are part of the end, I think it is our responsibility, you know, to talk to the public talk to the stakeholders. And that's where the Oceania Development Network comes in. It helps researchers communicate with policy makers in an effort to formulate good policy briefs. Linking research to policy is your ability to communicate. And so this doesn't come naturally. Get uh, researchers, young researchers, to write policy brief. Uh, talk to people who are policy makers. Uh, as well as to policy advisors and people who have written policy briefs, uh, you know, for ministers, for regional heads of uh, organizations, and so on and so forth. And we've been quite successful in doing that. However, it's often easier said than done, as policymakers aren't always forthcoming. If uh, our politicians 
and our senior civil servants also work more closely with centers of research and there is a two-way communication going then you know there is a whole lot uh, there is a pool of uh, you know research uh, uh, capabilities that they can utilize and uh, that's where you know it will be a mutually beneficial thing the researchers go and do the research provide policy options which you know if the governments want to take uh, the options up any particular one of them a combination of them that will help but uh, I think we need to open up communication and, and part of that you know, difficult process is this business of building trust and uh, I think uh, we all need to become more trusting of each other. Even the Global Development Network acknowledges the constraints in linking policy makers to researchers. The job of policy makers is not the same as the job of researchers, so the interaction is not spontaneous, it's not easy and the framework is, the time frame is not the same. Uh, a, a decision maker needs to take decisions tomorrow and then he might be willing to ask researchers but he wants the answer tomorrow. When you ask a researcher to work on a subject, on a question, the answer will be, well, maybe in six months I'll start having developed a research program on that. This connection is made difficult by the difference of time frames for conducting serious studies and reach serious results and the fact that policymakers need these results immediately. So what we need to do is have a sort of ongoing interaction, ongoing debate and exchange of views, uh, so that the policymakers uh, are, are better informed. On the other side of the coin, researchers need to assess the policy implications before undertaking research. The concept of actually translating the research to policy and making sure that whatever work we do actually goes to the policy planners, otherwise whatever we do is just just there. If, if it's actually not benefiting your country, your economy, there's actually no point of doing any research. There's a, there's a two-way loop between the, the, the researchers and the government agencies. The reason being is that in order to research, we have to need the readily available data. And I think it is important for, the, for, for, our, for our young researchers, the data is really readily available and, and one, one way we could do that is through involving government in research. And for young researchers who have had the opportunity to be part of a global network of researchers, it's the big break that can virtually open up a host of opportunities. I strongly believe that as young researchers this is a good platform or this is a perfect opportunity for us young researchers to step out and contribute greatly and also uh, try and develop a mindset or try and increase our knowledge or intellectual capacity to an extent where we could be utilized, where we could be engaging in further researches and would be again present in such foyers or such arenas where we could present on issues. for this week for questions or comments do email us talkbusiness at pgtv.com.fj remember you can view what you've just seen on our website that's www.pgtv.info and follow the links to talk business thank you for joining us do join us again at the same time next week until then have a productive